Welcome to the I Love Negotiating Podcast, where we aim to equip you with the practical strategies, techniques, tactics, and tools to dramatically improve your negotiation results. My name is Jan Potgieter. Over the past 15 years, I've consulted to and trained many of the world's leading brands in more than 60 countries to help them improve their business negotiation results. I've trained just under 10,000 people face-to-face in a small group format, and I've negotiated on camera one-on-one with almost 4,000 people from most major cultural backgrounds. In this podcast, I want to use my experience to bring perspective to your negotiation challenges. So, uh, D- Darren Ruiz, uh, thank you very much for, for joining me today. It's, uh, it's a, both a, a privilege and an honor to be able to uh, get a perspective from uh, your experience and, and, and your view of life, as it were. Thanks, John. So, well, well, welcome to our podcast. Thank you, and thanks for the invite. So, so, Darren, interesting thing. I mean, SAP, obviously one of the one of the premier companies, premier brands in, in in the world of business, been around for a long time. What is what is your view? Why has SAP continued to be so successful for so long in, in an industry that is really really competitive? I think there's a few reasons. Um, SAP has uh, for, for for over four decades have produced uh, very relevant um, technology. And I think the the fact that they've remained relevant, and I and I and I use the word relevant, you know, on purpose, um, uh, is is really one of the biggest contributing factors. The fact that they've um, they've moved with the market. The business used to be an ERP business, but today ERP is by, is by far not the biggest part of the business. Um, you know, being able to to move with what our customers are looking for, um, I would say is 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 one of the the big reasons. And then the second one is that SAP has a, a, a great reputation for having a very high customer empathy. Um, there are a lot of vendors in the market that have fairly adversarial relationships with their customers, um, and that's not the case with SAP. So SAP has a, um, I, I don't want to you know, overuse the word customer-centric, um, but we have very deep, um, you know, very, very close relationships with our customers. Um, and I think that's the nature of, of, of where ERP started with those customers, um, you know, tens and thousands of customers who, who run mission-critical applications and, and they be, have come over decades to rely very deeply on SAP. And that forms a level of relationship or based on trust and, and, and reliance um, that, that um, you know, really builds long-lasting relationships. So I think that, that you know, that customer centricity, um, both from a, a, a focus and relationship perspective as well as the technology is, is what has led to this longevity and success. That's, uh, I mean, that's great to hear. You know, so often I encounter organizations where they, they kind of, you know, they, they say that they're all about partnership, that they're all about customer service, but it's very seldom that you really see that in evidence. Yes. No, look, it, 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 it's absolutely the way it is at SAP. That's fantastic. Um, but Darren, you know, certainly from a negotiation context, but also maybe an overall business context, your your portfolio, your experience is, is, is wide, it's global. What has been your view of the difference between men and women when, when it comes to doing business? You know, have, you, have you seen that reflected in, in the way that SAP conducts its business or that your customers conduct their business? Look, I, I, there's definitely a, a difference in the way men and women are treated when it comes to the workplace, and the reality is, is that you know, it, it, that goes both ways. So in many cases, our customers are women, um, in, in many cases, the employees or the, the salespeople that we're putting in front of customers are women, and and there's always a different dynamic. You know, when, when there are two women dealing with each other, when there are two men dealing with each other, um, you know, that, that dynamic is always different. And what we try and do, what I've always tried to do, is to try and make sure that we have a, a good match. Um, and that's not always, a, you know, it's not always the same gender. Sometimes it's a, it's a different gender, and it works on the personalities of the people involved. So I think, you know, the, the way I would answer the question is, is it's definitely different, um, yeah. but, but it's, 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 it's more a, a function of the personality types of the people. And I think, you know, I've, I've had a lot of experience of, of having very, you know, very successful, very good salespeople who've built great relationships with their customers. Um, and, you know, you, 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 the, the customer changes. So, you know, the, the CEO or the CFO or the CIO, whoever it is that we're dealing with, leaves and a new person comes. And all of a sudden, that relationship doesn't work anymore. And at that point, you have to look at how you change the account team um, in order to better suit the customer because ultimately, you, you, you know, you want to make sure that that customer is comfortable dealing with you. 
Um, I think an overall comment is that, you know, really good um, uh, top uh, female executives, um, you know, are, are, are incredibly successful in the industry because, the, again, I spoke about customer empathy earlier. Um, you know, I think, you know, in general, uh, women are, are, are more empathetic when it comes to, to engaging with their customers or, or maybe just generally. Um, uh-huh. And that lends itself to, to, to really good relationships with our customers. Um, so, you know, I, 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 you know I, 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 when I look at my sales team, certainly the, the most successful um, sales leaders and, and sales people are women. Um, uh, so, you know, that's certainly a trend that I see. That's very interesting. I know, you know, from from experience of working with some other clients, you know, there, there's some industries where obviously uh, it's been more traditionally dominated by by males. I mean, think think maybe construction or infrastructure or those kind of environments, and and yes. women are making inroads there. But it's been it's been a tough journey for them, you know. And I think a, a lot of the time, and it's interesting to hear you echo, echo that the, the women who rise to the top are often super competent because they've had to overcome, you know kind of an environment that was designed by men. Yes. Look, I think, you know, from my perspective, it makes, makes me sound like I'm, I'm, I'm overly biased. Look, I, I drive towards a, a 50-50 ratio um, of, 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 of gender diversity in my team. Uh, my global head of sales for, for my business is, is a woman. Um, she's, yes. you know, a, a phenomenal sales leader and, and, and is doing a phenomenal job and has, has had a, a fantastic career. Um, but, you know, I think that that diversity gives strength. And, I mean, you know, you and I both grew up in South Africa. We understand the value of that diversity. Um, and that's, you know, whether it's gender diversity, whether it's racial diversity, whether it's uh, generational diversity, all of those things, I believe, give you um, options. Um, they give you, you know, they, they give you options that give you the ability to try and, you know, find a good match with that customer. And ultimately, you know, nobody wants to... You know, no one wants to do business with someone they don't like or that they, you know, they don't get on with. Yes, yes. Um, so, you know, that's really what we're trying to do, is to find a match for that customer, whatever that match may be. Yeah, which, which is amazing. There can, be, there can be harmony and diversity. It doesn't have to be conformity. Yeah. No, a- absolutely. No, I mean, that, that uh, you know, that lack of diversity, to, you know, when you end up with sales teams where everybody's the same, whether, whether they're all women, whether they're all the same age, whether they're all men, yeah, whatever yeah. it is, that, that lack of diversity tends to, to lead uh, to an unhealthy uh, environment. Uh, uh, very interesting, very interesting, Darren. In, in, in your experience, what's your, what's your view of the conventional wisdom when, when we talk about business negotiation? What is, has what is your experience taught you? Yeah, I mean, look, it's an interesting question because I think everybody's idea of what conventional wisdom in negotiation is, is probably different. Um, I think, um, you know, I... I, I it really depends on, on, on what you mean by conventional wisdom. Um, you know, maybe if we if, if, if you if you give me a couple of points on what, what you think the yeah. conventional wisdom look, is, and then I'll, I'll look, comment. Do, do, do you know, I, I ask guys when we work with them, I ask people, I say, you know, what do you understand? What do we mean with the term negotiation? Probably yes. the standard response is folks will come up with something like, you know, it's a, it's a win-win or it's, a, you know, it's finding, it's finding something of mutual benefit. Etc. You know, and, and, and there you know, a couple of different spins on that. What would what would be your view? So look, I think when it comes to win win, I, I think that you know, in the context of my industry, um, or to be honest, in in my personal life, I think that um, you know, the the, the the for for the for the the, the benefit of, of a long term relationship with a customer, um, the customer has to feel like they've won. Um, and this is something that I think I've, I've spoken to my guys uh, about a lot, and it's certainly something that I coach my negotiators on, is that it is, it, you know, it, it's, we, we by definition are winning because we're closing the deal. Um, you know, if the competition don't get the deal, then we've won. Um, you know, obviously we, we want to do good business. We don't want to do bad sure, business, so sure. there's, a, there's a caveat there. But provided we, we're doing a deal that we're comfortable we should be doing, it is more important that the customer feels like they've won uh, yeah. Than that we feel like we've won, and to be honest, it's 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 an important point because when you're in the heat of a negotiation, and 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 it tends to become, um, you know, fairly. I, I don't want to use the word adversarial because that makes it sound negative, but it, it it can become competitive. Maybe competitive is a better word. Um, yeah. Then you know, this isn't a board game. You know, at the end of the day, uh, the customer needs to feel like they've won, and I want my customers to feel like they've won. 
because, you know, that's going to lead to, to a better relationship in the future. Um, you know, and I think irrespective of what the situation is. So, you know, I think as far as win-win is concerned, you know, it, it, it does need to be a win-win. Um, it's just understanding from, from our perspective what winning means for us. Yeah. Winning is not getting the extra million euros. Winning yeah. is getting the deal. Um, for the customer, it's getting the right price um, yeah. because they've already made the decision to do business with us. The other thing that's really important, especially in enterprise software, is that the price can, all, you know, the price can always go down. The price can always go yeah. down a bit more. Um, but the problem is, is that when that price goes down, um, generally something needs to be taken away. Um, yes. You know, whether that's the level of support that the customer is getting, whether that's the implementation services that they're getting, uh, whether it's you know what technology is in the bill of materials. Um, and it's very important that, that that you're in the detail with the customer to the extent that they understand um, that th- there is a relationship between what they're getting and what they're paying. Um, yes. And all too often, I see um, salespeople lose um, that um, uh, the link, know, the link lose, lose the sight. Yeah. The link. The link is exactly yeah. right. Yeah. They yeah. lose yeah. the. They lose sight of that link, or they allow the customer to lose sight of that link, and it becomes very one-dimensional in that people are only talking about the price. And obviously, yeah. that's a huge issue um, because you know when customers, whoever, irrespective of what you're negotiating. When you lose sight of, of, of what it is that you're buying and only what you're paying for it, um, that becomes a big issue. And it's something that, you know, we'll, we'll all be able to relate to. You know, m- m- most that's of us, most of the people listening to this will buy a car. Um, and when you go in and you negotiate the price for the car, um, if, if, if the service, if the sales rep is not talking to you about the service plan or about the, the extras that are on the car, etc., if you remain focused only on the price, and in the background, you're busy removing stuff as the price goes down, then that becomes a problem. Um, you know, when you remain focused on the value and you're saying, well, look, you know, if the, cost, the car's going to cost a bit more, but in, for this additional value, um, you know, it has these extras, you have this tire warranty, you have this maintenance plan, you're not going to have to pay for servicing in the future, um, yeah. it's got this uh, roadside assist value, um, you know, then people are far more comfortable with the price. But the reality is, is that all too often, we do lose sight of what customers are getting for that value, and then it becomes problematic. It's, uh, I mean, it's interesting what you say, Derek, because you know, I, I think a lot of people think of negotiation as an event rather than a process. Yeah. And, you, you know, that's often when you get surprised with having to deal with the kind of confronting price in a one-dimensional way. You know, if you, if you recognize, and clearly to me, it, you know, it sounds like you guys are really good at doing that. If you recognize that negotiation is an overall process where, yeah. you, know, the, you know, the context you know, for, for the transaction is, is created right up front, and then it, you know, it, it incorporates all these different levers, you know, all these different things that uh, that, that that comprise the value. Then uh, you know, you, you ease things along. Obviously, if, if it just gets down to price, often we just find ourselves haggling. Sure. Look, I, I think another data point there would be that you know, really good negotiators, um, and and this is not a negative towards the, the customer. You know, whether they're on the customer side or whether they're on the on the other side, um, really good negotiators will will get what they want, and the opposition or the or the or the person they're negotiating with will feel like they've got what that what they want because you've got a level of transparency and and they followed a process Absolutely. as you put it um, that, that, that 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 creates a better understanding of what everybody's getting. You know, I have lots of examples of where, you know, a, a, a customer situation, and, you know, this is whether it's at SAP or at my previous role, where a situation will be escalated to me with a customer where when I dig into it and I speak to the customer, the price that they've got is actually very, very good. Um, mm. The value is very, very high, but the customer is unhappy. Um, and then there yes. will be other situations where, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll do an analysis of, of, a, of a large deal, um, and I'll go, wow, you know, you know, the, 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 for, from a, from a, an SAP perspective, this is a phenomenal deal. And yet the customer is very, very happy. Um, okay. and then it comes down to how we've negotiated the deal. It comes down to the, as you put it, the process. Um, it comes down to, you know, articulating the value rather than just the price. Um, yeah. and, 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 and that is absolutely something that, that people need to recognize plays a huge role in both the customer satisfaction and what the likely outcome is likely to be from a value perspective. Uh, that, I mean, that's super insightful, there, and I tell them that we encounter folks with the intuitive understanding of the importance of 
uh, engaging human nature in the process of creating satisfaction rather than just leading yes. to the evidence. Yeah. Absolutely. That, 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 that's really smart. In, in your view and experience, Darren, then why do you think people fail when it comes to negotiations? What are the mistakes people make? No, I mean, look, we've just touched on one now, which is, is forgetting to, to, to articulate the value and only focus on the price. Um, that's certainly one. Um, I think people, as I said earlier, it, it can become competitive. Um, yeah. And at the point that, it, that, that you lose sight of what you're trying to achieve and, and, and winning becomes the objective, um, you know, let, let's call it an emotional element. Um, yeah. That certainly can be why people fail. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, I, the, the one thing that I'm a, I'm a huge uh, proponent of uh, is, is planning and, and practice. Um, yes. You know, if, if we're in a in a situation where we're negotiating something with a customer, then uh, you know, I, I want I want a lot of planning to go into it. You know, if, if, if we've got a specific negotiation event or we've got a call, um, irrespective of what it is, then you know, for every for every ten minutes in front of that customer, I want uh, I want you know an hour of of prep, two hours of prep to make sure that we understand the detail, we understand the strategy, we understand exactly what it is that we're doing. So that we're better able to articulate that value. So we're not, you know, we're not allowing blind spots. Um, and yeah. then, you know, I want to role play it. So, you know, I, we put people in the room, um, and I want to understand exactly, you know, what w- what it is that they're going to say, so that we ensure that we are conveying the value um, and and ensuring that we understand the customer perspective. Because the reality is, we c- it, it's very easy to become myopic sometimes and lose sight of what the customer view is. You can you can become yeah. overly focused yeah. on, on on your side of it. You know, I spoke about the value that customers are getting. It's very yeah. easy to go, well, look, you know what? You're going to get that road fight assistant. You're going to get the, 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 yeah. the tire uh, policy, and you're going to get the, the windshield protection. You know, if the customer doesn't value those things and the customer doesn't want those things, then there's no point in putting them in. Um, and, 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 you know, I find that in the role plays, yeah. that, tends yeah. to, you know, that tends to uncover those blind spots. So, you know, the, the, the preparation is, is, is a big thing also. That's amazing. That's amazing, that insight there, Darren. Uh, very mature view. The, um, you know, from your perspective, so, so a couple of things that are interesting, you know, when, whenever we work with organizations, and, and, and this has been true uh, just about anywhere in the world we've gone, you know, and I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to do this in 60 countries, and I've never had a different answer. You know, everybody always says to me that the, that the most difficult negotiations that they face are not the external ones. It's not the ones with the customers. It's the internal ones. You know, uh, uh, aligning your own organisation. Would you yes. would, would you say that this is this is something that's also true in, in in your environment that those tend to be more challenging the internal ones? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know SAP has got eighty three thousand odd employees, um, and uh, you know I think in an organisation the size there's a certain amount of of control that is put in place to make sure that the commitments we make to customers and, and the way in which we do our business is, is ethical and, and, uh, and consistent. Um, yeah. You know, you would, you, you would imagine that uh, trying to make sure that 83,000 people are all giving the same message is, is a relatively complex thing to do. So I think sure. that the internal negotiation can be difficult. One of the benefits at SAP, and, you know, you have to know where to go, but one of the benefits at SAP is that we have a, a, a quite a flat structure. Um, it's not very hierarchical. Um, so, you know, a, a sales guy is, is very likely to, be, to, to reach out directly to me and say, look, I'm trying to do this. I'm getting some internal resistance. Can you help me? Um, yeah. And that's not a cultural phenomenon in a lot of organizations. So, you know, certainly I came to SAP, you know, just over three years ago. I didn't expect to find it that way. Um, but I think that when organizations, irrespective of how big they are or how much bureaucracy there is in order to protect the customers and the organization, um, provided you have a mechanism to escalate um, effectively and efficiently, so quickly and decisively, um, and, and that your leadership are empowered to make decisions when that is required, um, then, then it works pretty well. And fortunately, that's the way it works with SAP. So, you know, it, al- although there are processes and, and protocols in place, um, you know, the escalation is fairly simple uh, and it's encouraged. Um, and fortunately, as a leader in the business, I am empowered, which means that I'm able to, to cut through, you know, that complexity pretty quickly. Yes. Um, so, you know, that, that helps a lot. But yes, I would agree that in most organizations, um, that internal negotiation can very often be difficult, more difficult than dealing with the customer. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. And then, Darren, what, 
What's your view? And I know this is once again, it, you know, it's not intended to be a loaded question, just you know, more sure. anecdotal. Um, you know, what is your what is your view when it comes to cultural background? So SAP, obviously, uh, even though it has German roots, very very international, very global company, operates probably in just about every country where where folks do big big business. You know, what is uh, what, what is your view? What is your you know uh, experience when it comes to culture and negotiation? Yeah, look, I, I, you know, we touched earlier on the fact that it comes down to people's personalities. Um, and what I would say is, is that there are, there are certainly some countries where the, the cultural nuances are very dominant um, and tend to override um, what, are, what are largely global trends or global uh, um, characteristics. So, you know, countries like, uh, like Japan, for example, yeah, uh, yeah. or Israel, for example, um, where you know what you the complexity that you deal with, and, and Israel and Japan being you know opposite ends of the spectrum, um, you know that they can be very very consistent um, in their um, in their characteristics. With the, the Israelis being um, you know very adversarial, very vocal, um, and 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 very consistent in in the way that they behave, um, and and the Japanese exactly the opposite. Um, in that it's very um, uh, very ritualistic. Um, there is a lot of ritual in the process. Um, you know what people are saying is not necessarily what they mean. They are desperate not to disappoint anybody, and there's a very yeah. uh, important um, element of of of, uh, of not wanting to say no, for example. Um, yeah. But again, like the Israelis, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, they're very consistent. Uh, yeah. in, in that behavior, you know, it, it, you, you're going to find the same thing from most customers. But I would say that, you know, outside of those two, um, there is a lot of, of, of commonality um, in, in what people want and, and the way that they go about getting it um, in, in most countries that I've, I've, I've worked in and look, I've worked all over the world. Um, so you know, I think it's it's it, it, it outside of those two which come to mind immediately because they're so consistent in their um, in, in their in their difference. Um, I, you know, whether, whether it's you know, I'm just kind of rattling through my mind whether you're in Brazil or whether you're in Mexico, whether you're in Indonesia, whether you're in South Africa. It really comes down to the person that you're dealing with, and and really it comes down to the same thing, which is that you know people want to feel like they're getting a good deal. Um, they want you to be transparent. They want you to be consistent. Um, and you know, if, if uh, you, the one thing that I would say, if, you know, for, for the sales leadership that are listening to this, or for, for executives that are leading to this, is that one of the biggest problems that that I have in understanding what's happening in a transaction is typically when I'm getting it second hand or third hand. Uh, okay. There is no substitute for me getting on a phone or getting on a plane and getting in front of a customer because. In 95% of cases where I'm being told there's a problem, um, there isn't really a problem. We're just not listening. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, m- my ability to cut through that by getting in front of a customer or getting on a phone with a customer, in 95% of cases, um, I- I- I'm able to solve the problem because I actually get the information um, yeah. firsthand rather than getting it filtered through somebody who's either misunderstood or doesn't want to give me the news. So, you yeah. know, it's not unusual for a deal to be forecast or for a transaction to be forecast, and then there's a problem, and I'll get 26 excuses why the deal can't happen. And you get on the phone yeah. with the customer, and, and they go, look, I told them three months ago I wasn't going to do the deal. You know, you go, well, yes, yes, okay, yes. you know, I'm, I'm glad I made this call. So, you know, a, a, a lot of it is, is smoke and mirrors, um, and, you yeah. know, I think... Uh, you know, getting to the source of the information is, is, is often the best way to get to the bottom of it. Um, and a lot of the, you know, where this question started was the cultural differences. A lot of these yeah. cultural differences are used as smoke screens to obfuscate yeah. the real information. And, and, and would, you, would you agree, um, you know, that, that, that through the increased use of, you know, email and phone calls yes. for interaction rather than face-to-face meetings, obviously it, it amplifies the opportunity for misunderstanding. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, I, I, you know, you say email and phone calls. I mean, I think the reality is that I, a phone call would still be great. You know, what, what we yeah. find today um, is that there is an inordinate amount of, of, of email. Um, and, and, you know, uh, us speaking to customers, uh, you know, especially with a, with a millennial generation firmly entrenched in the workplace now, 
um, speaking to customers or engaging with customers via um, via text or WhatsApp. Yes. Um, and, you know, yes, I think we all know from our personal lives what the propensity is to misunderstand what's going on when you're having a WhatsApp conversation with someone. Um, yeah. But, yeah, you know, I, I, I think, you know, there, there is little substitute for being able to just pick up the phone or get in front of a customer. Um, you know, that, that is certainly something that I encourage, you know, my people to do more, try not lose that human yeah. touch. And ultimately, you need to build relationships with people. You know, we started this conversation yeah with the importance of, of being able to build a relationship with someone. Um, you know, people, you know, it's, it's an overused term, but people buy from people. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, we will all have experienced the situation where, uh, you know, you, you're working in accounts, you have little success, um, and then there's an account management change and somebody comes in and all of a sudden the account is lit on fire and there's loads of opportunity. And it's, yeah. it's a personality thing. You know, people suddenly like each other and, and, and they go, you know, actually, I trust this person. I find them credible yeah. and I want to do business with them. It's as simple as that. And that's not going to happen by email. That's, that's right. Reality. That's right. That's right. Uh, great insight there, though. Great insight. Just a couple more questions just uh, before we wrap up. Uh, sure. You know, you've been, you've been very successful in building your career. Do you have, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not expecting it's all down to... Uh, the precise formula, but uh, you know, if, if you were to give our audience some pointers and you say, you know what, this has been my my formula. This is what's resulted in me being successful. What would you say that, yeah. that would be? So, look, I think the first thing that I say is, is that I've been very lucky. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I put part of success is, is undoubtedly being in the right place at the right time, um, and I've been very fortunate in my career to to be in the right place at the right time. So, you know, I, I, I think that's been a, a, a characteristic and, and, you know, I'm very, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, the next thing is, is that I work very hard, Jan. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, a solid 16, 18 hour a day person. And, uh, you know, I can tell you that uh, I've, I haven't put an out of office on my email for the last 15 years. Um, I, uh, up, up until fairly recently, I had a, 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 a very unfortunate health situation. Uh, but, you know, in the last, 13, 14 years before that, I haven't had a sick day, sick day from work. Um, and, uh, you know, I work really, really hard. So I'm very, you know, I, 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 my, my philosophy has always been that I can't guarantee I'm going to be the most creative person in the room. I can't guarantee I'm going to be the brightest person in the room, but I can control that I'm the hardest working person in the room. That's something that I have infinite control over. So, you know, I think I've been lucky. I work very hard. Um, and then the third thing is, is that I've been very focused on, on where I want to go uh, from a career perspective. So I've always had a plan. Um, yeah. And, you know, plans, plans need to be changed. You know, you need to be, you know, be able to be flexible and, and dynamic, and, and I'm very comfortable with change. Um, but you have to have a plan. You have to know where you're going. And, and critically, and it's probably the most common mistake that I, and at any point I mentor five people, and I see this in every single person that I mentor, is that when I start to work with them, I say, do you have a plan? And they say, absolutely. My next job is X. Um, they never, they never, ever have thought about what's after that. Um, right. And that's something that I always work on. And the problem is, is that with only knowing where you want to go next, um, it's very difficult to be positioning yourself for, for where you want to be after that. And the reality is, is that when, when you promote someone or when I promote someone or, or whatever, you very rarely promote them with only that job in mind. If I'm yes. going to take a sales guy and move him into a first-line sales manager role, I very, very rarely am thinking about whether he will make a good first-line sales manager. Most of the time, I'm thinking about, is he going to make a good second-line sales manager or is this a future um, you know, sales director, yes. managing director, chief operating officer for the business? Because to be honest, if they, if they don't have the runway for the future, then I probably, you know, I'm probably not going to give them that shot at being a first-line sales manager. So people need to be thinking two jobs ahead at least. They need to be thinking, you know, if, 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 if they're a sales guy today and they want to be a, a, the, the managing director of the UK business for SAP, they need to be thinking, what do I need to do in order to, to be perceived as, as relevant for that role? What do I need to do from a development perspective in order to get to that role? Um, and, and what performance am I going to need to deliver? What sacrifices am I prepared to make in order to get to, to, to that next role? And that tends to put them in, in really good shape. 
And that's something that I've always done. So, you know, it's, it's not about um, being overly ambitious or, or not executing on the current role because if you look at my CV, I've, I've always done the jobs that I've done for many years. You know, people tend to sometimes hop quite a lot. That's not been the case with me. You know, in the last 14 years, I've worked for two companies. Um, so, you know, I've been very consistent. Um, as, as my roles have changed, I've always retained responsibility for what I had before I moved. So yeah. my, my sphere of influence has grown. Um, but I think it's, it's always come down to me having a very clear plan on, on, on where I'm going. So a good dose of luck, lots of hard work, and having a plan. Huh. Sounds a little cliche, but it, it, it works. No, no, that's very insightful. Though. Last question I have for you. You, know, you talk about mentoring others. Um, yeah. And, 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 you know, this is a characteristic of success, being teachable, submitting yourself to, to instruction, to Absolutely. correction, etc. That's something that sounds intuitive to you. Who's been a role model to you? Who, who would you say, you know, can you identify, and, you know, you, you can name names or not, however you feel sure. comfortable, but, 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 but have you looked up to others? Have you found that, that you know, submitting yourself to, to coaching, to, you know, uh, the benefit of learning from the experience of others has helped you? Yeah, so look, I mean, you, you made the point already, which is that being teachable, um, understanding what your weaknesses are, um, and being open to, to change the way you do things is very important. And I think, you know, if, if, if I think about my earlier career um, in, in, in Software AG, my previous company, the people who, who would have worked for me um, in 2005, 2006, back, you know, when I was the country manager in South Africa, um, and, and some of them still work for me now, so I couldn't have been that bad. But they'll tell you that I've changed a lot. You know, I'm, I'm yeah, very different yeah, yeah. to what I was, um, you know, 13, 14 years ago um, yeah. in my leadership style, in, in, in the way that I do things. Um, and and that really that comes down to having an appetite to, to adapt the way you do things and, and change. Um, and, and the reality is, is that it's, it, you, you, can't, you can't self-teach. You know what I mean? It's very difficult to have that level of self-awareness without somebody to, to help you um, reflect on it and identify um, the, 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 you know, the areas of improvement. So I think you know, the, the reality for me is that I've, I've had, for, for the last 10 ideas or, or so, there have been two, two gentlemen. Uh, one is a guy called Jacques Chalmers, uh, who's a, a, a French gentleman who, who you know, I've spent quite a bit of time with over the last few years, um, and another gentleman called Peter Casey, uh, who's a, a, an Irish uh, gentleman who lives in the U.S. And both mm -hmm. Peter and Jacques have both had a profound impact, I think, on me over the last you know five to ten years um, as I've developed. But it's a very informal relationship. You know, neither of them are, yeah. are formal mentors who I spend time with every week or every month. It's just not the way it works. Yeah. The way it works is is you know they're friends, but they're both you know seasoned, experienced business executives who give me a very different perspective. On, yeah, uh, yeah. on on how I look at what I do. And, I, you know, I can kind of ad hoc call them up for advice. Um, more recently, at, 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 since I've been at SAP, the last couple of years, um, I've worked with a, a gentleman called Terry Nordell, and, and my engagement with Terry is a bit more structured. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he attends my executive meetings, um, he gets to know my team, and he, and he works with me and has worked very closely with me. And Terry, again, has had a profound impact on, on my development over the last few years. Um, but I equally learn... From, I learned from my bosses. I learned from people who work for me. Um, you know, and that kind, you know, when, when you when you when you understand the importance of talent and you understand the importance of building, you know, multidisciplinary, um, uh, diverse teams, and, and you you know, a lot of people talk about hiring people who are better than them. It's, it's a bit of a misnomer, misnomer because nobody that you hire is going to be better than you at everything. What you're trying to do, in my opinion, is you're trying to hire people who are better than you at some things. Um, yes. And, you know, certainly, you know, if I think about the team that I've built now, um, I recruited a lady called Melissa Di Donato um, who, who, who joined me recently, who's a, a phenomenal sales leader. Um, and, and I genuinely believe that Melissa could do that job better than me. Um, yes. I hired a guy called Christian Pedersen uh, to, to drive our product uh, moving forward, and there is no doubt in my mind that Christian can do that better than me. There are things that I do better than them, but when it comes to their areas of domain, they do it better than me, and, and I've learned from both of them. So I think it's, it's, it's really more about having a willingness to learn and being able to identify, you know, what the weaknesses are and having people who can help you to, to, to be more introspective and, and reflect on what those weaknesses are that leads you to become, you know, better at what you are. And it doesn't matter whether you're, 
you know, whether you're running a, a 3 billion euro business at SAP or whether you're, you know, you're an individual quota carrier salesperson, that introspection yeah. and ability to self-reflect and improve yourself, both personally and professionally, is, is very important. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that, you know, people are very eager to learn and to acquire knowledge and to adapt when they're at school or when they're at varsity. But I see a lot of people hitting the workplace and they think that process has ended. Um, yeah, and it, yeah. it shouldn't end. You know, that self-development process is important. Uh, Darren, that's amazing. I, uh, I'm, I'm mindful that we've taken up uh, quite a bit of your time, but I, I really want to thank you for having the willingness to to share some of your experience and insights to, uh, you know, w- with our audience and to those who you know who wish to improve their their, their prospects for success. I think uh, you know it's been very generous of you. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Andrew. It's been a pleasure chatting to you, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>